Welcome back to The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. We're about to check out the front pages of the National Dailies as usual and bring you up with speed to what's going on, with what's going on across the board. And uh, I'd like to start off with the Daily Trust newspaper. Now, uh, hopefully we're able to um, uh, connect with Femi Lawson, who will be our guest on the show this morning. Uh, we're just having some technical issues, but we hope that we're able to join up, uh, connect with him as soon as possible. I start off with a Daily Trust newspaper this morning, and uh, the bold caption says, despite seam and NIN linkage, that's the NIN, kidnappers, bandits still demand ransom via phones. Uh, it's a bold caption on page three of the Daily Trust newspaper. Uh, you also have riders, why? It isn't working, experts quoted on that. Policy effective, Pantam is quoted also. Amidst legal issues, PDP to proceed with convention. It's also another caption you find on the Daily Trust newspaper this morning. Buhari's led, Buhari leads Nigeria's delegation to Saudi Arabia. Uh, Buhari leads Nigeria's delegation to Saudi Arabia's investment summit. That's on page 52. And 780 million Naira fraud, EFCC grills ex-Senate president, Ayim. That's also on page uh, five of the Daily Trust newspaper this morning. Gunmen attack Ogun Church, abduct three worshipers. Gunmen attack Ogun Church, abduct three worshipers. Uh, another caption, and just before we move away from the Daily Trust newspaper, you have 33 states may not pay salaries as 172 billion naira deduction grounds revenue disbursement. 33 states may not pay salaries as 172 billion naira deductions ground revenue disbursement. That's also another caption on page uh, 24 of the Daily Trust newspaper this morning. I'm sure you pick up a copy to get all of the information. All right, now let's, let's move to the Daily Independent. It says here, yeah, impending execution of uh, Basel III may hurt banks, as a report. Dividend payouts to be constrained for lenders with low capital. Buhari travels to Saudi Arabia for investment summit and lesser hajj. 2023 presidency, why Tinubu won't back Oshimbajo if he drops out of race. Yahya Bello can never be APC presidential candidate, says uh, Shage. Federal government vows to recapture all inmates who escaped in Oyo jail attack. Also, court case, convention not meant to truncate anyone's mandate, says the PDP. Urges members and supporters to ignore dis distractions. Defeats APC in rescheduled Zango Kataf local government election in Kaduna. Lagos Airport COVID-19 scandal. Sca uh, staff whose account uh, travelers used to pay PCR test fee uh, into suspended. In 2023, APC leaders reject calls for Tinubu to succeed Buhari. Also on the Daily Independent, federal government draws uh, flags for planning to spend 5.1 billion naira on Katsina Airport. Stakeholders say airport is not viable. It's a waste of resources. Editors flay security situations, say it's impacting the econ economy negatively. And those are the big ones on the Daily Independent. All right, let's move away from the Daily Independent and check out the leadership newspaper this morning. 73% debt servicing puts Nigeria's economy on edge. 73% uh, debt servicing puts Nigeria's economy on edge. That's on page four. How we're closing electricity metering gap. That's what the federal government is quoted to say. Uh, you find details on page seven. Gandu J offers blind teacher automatic job. That's on page eight. Rivers not fighting federal government over VAT collection. Uh, the governor of Rivers State, WK, is quoted on that. Security operatives rearrest 446 or your prison inmates. It's on page uh, 12 of the leadership newspaper uh, this morning. President Mohammed Buhari leaves for Saudi Arabia Investment Summit. Uh, that might just be dominating all of the papers this morning. That's on page four of the leadership newspaper. And you also have, uh, let's see if we can take this one. Fortunately, not so uh, clear. I'll let us slide. All right, that's the much we can take on the leadership newspaper this morning. All right, now let's move to the punch. 
Uh, SIM NIN linkage. Subscribers push for two-month extension as deadline expires on Sunday. Subscriber group says registration centers extremely crowded. Fresh extension likely after NIMC and NCC reviews, as uh, Tel confirms. Also, Otedola shareholders analysts project a spike in FBN share price. Aviation agencies plan 436.6 billion naira revenue, budget 55.86 billion naira for security. INEC needs 17,618 workers to conduct APC and PDP primaries. And also, um, the World Bank blacklists 18 Nigerian firms and individuals for corruption. Still on the punch this morning, ASU cautions federal government on 30 billion naira revitalization fund. October 31st deadline nears. Um, we can also find this morning, NDLEA seizes UK, Malaysia-bound drugs, owners arrested in Lagos. Gunmen demand 6 million naira for three kidnapped Ogun worshippers. And uh, Odua, EFCC detains AIM over 780 million naira aviation ministry fraud a fund. Army detains soldier for assaulting Quara nurses during wife's delivery. And uh, Buhari jets off to Saudi for investment summit today. Finally, uh, Amotekun deploys personnel in boundary communities. 13 fleeing or your inmates arrested. Good morning to Femi Lawson. Thanks for joining us uh, on uh, The Breakfast. Good morning. All right. I'm, I'm, I want us to start with the president going to Saudi Arabia for an investment summit. Um, for some reason, there's some, you know, criticism. Um, and, of course, people saying, you know, that they're not sure what exactly or why. Um, so quickly share, you know, if some of these trips are still, of course, very important uh, to Nigeria and, um, you know, our economy. Yes, uh, the truth is that uh, we cannot, uh, you know, that make the importance of uh, foreign relations as far as uh, our economic development and uh, even social policy development as a country is concerned. Why people seem to be agitated sometimes when the president is embarking on some of these trips is basically because of uh, the anger occasioned by you know, the rising inflation in the country and the inability of the government seemingly to address the prevailing economic challenges uh, in the country. But if you look at it critically, there is nothing wrong in the president uh, embarking on such bilateral you know, moves to further push forward the economic prospect of the country, especially when such trips are centered around issues that can promote economic development, you know, which is, of course, the most needed area, one of the most needed areas that uh, the country must focus on at, at, at present. I don't think it is any way, in any way wrong, but uh, we must not also uh, overlook the fact that uh, economically at home, things are not all right, but people uh, agree and that is the uh, most times what is responsible for some question of the previous development. Okay, uh, let's check out the Daily Trust newspaper this morning uh, and share your thoughts on this one. It says, despite SIM and NIN linkage, kidnappers, bandits still demand ransom via phones. So it feels like you know, that particular effort, the SIM linkage and the NIN registration has not yielded any result. What could be responsible? Let's hear your thoughts. Well, you see, the war of terrorism and insecurity, we have often said it, is not a, a war of might, but a war of intelligence. Despite every effort that the government not to take military action, to impose sanctions, such as the registration of sin and iron and the like. The truth is that, can we say that this country has been able to make any considerable effort, uh, progress in terms of fighting insurgency and all sorts of terrorism in the country? The, question, the truth is that the country has not been able to do enough because while we are investing more in the hardware, in military infrastructure, in, you know, not just like NIN thin linkages. How much more is the country investing 
in intelligence gathering, in the war of intelligence, as far as the fight against you know, terrorism is concerned. The truth is that there has not been any major achievement other than some of those military actions and successes in the war against insurgency. Today, people are still being kidnapped. Ransom has been demanded, not only even in the northwest where any comes as a shot down or you know, there's a massive deployment of success. Uh, what do you call it? The truth is that even down south here, yeah, people are kidnapped almost on a daily basis. Only a few days ago, like you just reported now, worshippers were kidnapped in the premises of their church, and kidnappers are now you know, demanding ransom using the same tool of telecommunication. They are not writing letters. It tells you that it, it has not made as much as positive impact like you know, the minister wanted us to believe at, at that point. So I think more has to be done by the country in investing on intelligence gathering rather than you know, the other side to get approach of thinking it is by shutting down any communication and uh, it wasn't a uh, fiscal sanction that will cop terrorism. Yeah, but I mean, Femi Lawson, I'm, I'm sure that this was, you know, the expected turnout. So it shouldn't be shocking to anyone that it hasn't achieved much with regards security. And pretty much the same thing with uh, shutting down telecom services in certain areas in Zamfara and Katsina and all, and all those places. Um, from what reports are saying, those things haven't achieved much. Um, so why, why do you think we keep having these same knee-jerk reactions every now and then? Uh, to seemingly, you know, uh, you know, play along and, and look like there's action going on and achieve nothing? Well, the truth is that, you know, every policy of government that does not engage the citizens, that does not carry the people along, is bound to fail. If you look at the initiative behind the imposition of the linking of NIN and the same and, and every other policy of this government, you will realize that they come with such a fire brigade approach. They come like military fiat. You know, the minister just wakes up tomorrow and says, no. And from tomorrow, you must begin to register. You are still with your head and head. The government that does not engage citizens, there's no way where the minister or the, the president can be seen to have, you know, engage the media, the civil society, the religious organization, to mobilize them ahead of this policy. You know, you can't be prepared enough to just wake up and decree a policy as if you are in the military, you know, era and expect cooperation as much as needed on the part of the citizens. What you are seeing is the fact that the citizens are not enthusiastic about supporting government efforts, even though in the overall interest we have one or two other things to benefit because I am convinced that the more we can do on, you know, getting the identity of mobile phone users or national identity of our citizens is very important. But such policies must be people-centered. Such policies are easier when it is driven with the cooperation of the citizens. But the way this government and the operatives are, you know, embarking on these policies, it, they act often time as if they are dictating to school children. They ask us oftentimes as if they are the boss, you know, and we are the, the, the employees. Whereas they are the employees of the Nigerian people. So they must always give that honor and respect. So the people were taking or were embarking on any policy. Without that, you continue to see sabotage, you know, and all these kind of, uh, you know, consequences that are trained the same NIN, major, and other issues around intelligence gathering in the war against the soldiers in the country. It's very, very unfortunate. Yeah, um, and apologies for dragging on for so long with this one, but I, 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 I think it's, a, it's an important conversation, you know, in, in looking at the bigger picture, um, because we are six years down the line with the current government. Um, we've seen numerous, you know, of the, well, a couple of these policies every now and then. You know, every month there's a new law, a new policy by either the CBN or the um, um, Minister of uh, Digital Economy. Um, many of these policies have come up in the last six years. But, Femi Lawson, would you say that we've achieved much um, in the last six years as a nation? 
And what would this then tell you of the ideas that have come with this government um, with regards moving Nigeria forward? Well, you see, we, not, well, so we can continue to assume, especially when the you know, offices of the government go now statistics that are not part you know, by any physical reality on the basis of what uh, the government has been able to achieve. The truth is that if you look at what were the cardinal promises of the government when coming on board in 2015, you know, President Bari came on the premise of anti-corruption, security and economy. And we, in all fairness, see that our country is more secure than it was in 2015. And we sincerely say that the war against corruption and we want a reasonable extent when you look at the you know, caliber of corrupt you know, individuals and practices that are currently taking place under this government. Can we say that our economy has improved more than it was in 2015? So when the people begin to see past marks and assess themselves, I haven't made any progress in the last Okay. I am not one of those who want to easily agree. Good. We cannot but agree that there are certain areas that the government has been able to make progress, especially when you look at the you know, intervention in some of our critical infrastructure, like rail lines and some other critical infrastructures, which the administration of President Buhari has been able to take to another level. But the truth is that you know, if you look at some more fundamental issues, such as the economy, the security, and, you know, and the anti-corruption, the government cannot call itself that. The truth is that if we have not really gone backward beyond 2050, we have not really made any considerable progress. All right, let, let's also look at another headline and see if we can share your thoughts on this one. Uh, still on the Daily Trust newspaper. 33 states may not pay salaries as 172 billion naira deduction grounds revenue disbursement. Uh, what do you make of this, especially at the time where states are expected to be self-sufficient? There is no way states can be self-sufficient under a pedibotic democracy that we are currently operating. We have continued you know, to discuss this, even on your platform here, that if we get a, a point, you know, now we are at the point of borrowing money to pay salaries and all sorts of ridiculous expenses you know, to service the lifestyle of our politicians and the like. But if they get to a point where there may even be nothing to borrow again, if something fundamental is not done, it is on the head of that a country so endowed like that, and our state has endowed in both human and natural resources, and now at the point of not being able to pay ordinary salaries. Salaries should be the least of responsibilities of any serious state. We have critical infrastructure, we have healthcare, you have, you know, all sort of priorities that this state must embark upon. But today, salary has become a major issue becoming the most capital intensive that they cannot even pay. It tells you that the system has presently been practiced is not working. And every time we say this, these people are not willing to desist from this culture of feeling but democracy that takes our governor to Abuja every month are tapping and to get allocations to run their state. What will it cost us to really go back to the Part of true federalism that empowers our state you know, to explore their natural and mineral resources, to explore their own potential, and begin to be economically prosperous. When you have states that are so endowed, but are not by every enough to even pay salary, then you should know that something is wrong. So, beyond all this rhetoric, beyond all this lamentation, you know, by the federal government at this stage, I think. They should sit down and sincerely look for a way out of this culture of waiting 
but annotations to be shared at the end of every 30 days. This is ridiculous. All right. Um, on the Daily Independent, there's something here that says um, 2023 presidency. Why Tinubu won't back Oshimbajo if he drops out of race? And it also says, yeah, Yabilu can never be APC presidential candidate. I quickly share your views on the uh, Tinubu backing the vice president if uh, it gets to that. Well, whoever will become the candidate of the APC for the 2023 presidential election will ultimately be decided by the party who is president. But the truth is that, uh, you know, in politics, it's not, uh, it can really not predict what can happen in the next minute. The truth is that uh, it is within the right, even constitutionally, of uh, President Amir Shibadi to think, you know, if he told the time you know, to contest for the presidential, but even though as he made you known, likewise, as you had gone as he did. But considering the political relationship between the two, and uh, how far they have come, as uh, father and son politically, as they usually say, I think that will not be too difficult. And it will not necessarily be subject to the division of outsiders, especially those outside the Balatinobu political family, who is going to fly the secret of the party among the two of them, if they so decide to go into the race. Together, I don't think uh, it will be too difficult, uh, considering where they are, how far they have come together, and the fact that uh, both men have the right, even though the one may be competent more than the other, but both men have the right to vie for the position. I think the machinery of their political family is strong enough to the extent that uh, they are been able to produce somebody like Professor Amir Shabadi as the vice president. So determining who runs among the two of them, I don't think will be subject to the assumption of most of us who are outsiders or those who are not even from their political family. All right. Uh, let's quickly check out the leadership newspaper this morning. There's a caption that's quite interesting. 73% debt servicing puts Nigeria's economy on edge. 73% debt servicing puts Nigeria's economy on edge. Let's share your thoughts on this. It, 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 it's a worrisome thing, and it is the key, you know, of what we may expect as a misfortune to the economic process of the country and our capacity to develop other areas that are critical to nation development. Every year, we build our budget on external borrowing. Then we thought subsequent years to use our heavy to service this borrowing at such an alarming rate. This should really give us serious concerns of the I have seen a lot of people try to justify the fact that the country is viable, you know, they are credit worthy, this and that. But the truth is that for how long shall we continue to use a greater percentage? Of our understanding, the service debt. Many of these debt today cannot be traced to any fundamental development as far as the nation is concerned, other than what we have used to service the lifestyle of individuals and, and, and the political elite. So we should really be concerned about what the future holds, particularly for the younger generation who these debt are not going to be left behind for. This should call for serious concern and it should call for. I must then review, you know, of our policies, especially how much more we have to continue to borrow to service our annual budget. You know, it, it, it's unfortunate and unfair. Okay, and of course, um, I think we can just wrap up with the conversation on the uh, um, primaries and um, INEC's preparedness for the elections also in Anambra. It says on the punch, INEC needs 17,618 workers. Uh, to conduct APC and PDP primaries. So share your views on that one and also talk about the um, you know, uh, preparations for the Anambra State uh, Governorship elections. Um, you know. In a conduct with Mahmoud Yafut has been doing a lot, has made a lot of tremendous progress. 
and it has continued to show commitment to ensuring you know that the uh, institution of democracy is further strengthened. I think uh, the National Assembly and the federal government, as the case may be, should give all the needed support to INEC so as to develop its capacity to conduct federal elections in Nigeria. If you look at you know the initiatives of the commission over the recent past, especially those aimed at improving the credibility of our election, you will come to realize that it needs all this all the support we may give as a country. I'm going to Anambra. Anambra is going to be a very important election, not just to the political party, but to us as Nigerians, especially when you look at the security threat around this election that is just few days away. So we must be interested as Nigerians and we must continue to prevail of actors to ensure that peace is allowed during this election. Because if Anambra election fails on the ground of security, you know, or, or, or peace security rather, it is going to be a major step for future elections, particularly the general election in Nigeria, where you, especially when you look at the issues of insurgency, insecurity, almost in every part of the country. So, determining the election in Anambra and having a peaceful election is very important, and all stakeholders especially the political actors, must work towards ensuring that a number of elections is peaceful, Unec is allowed to do its job, and people are allowed to freely choose the next government of the state without any fear and any All right, and uh, I think we can wrap up uh, this morning. Femi Lawson, thank you very much for kicking off our Monday morning for us. Um, we wish you a very pleasure. interesting week ahead. Thanks. All right. Good morning once again. Um, a little bit of history coming up next. We'll be telling you about something that happened in the year 2009 in Baghdad. A bombing that uh, led to, of course, more than 100 people dead. We'll talk about it when we come back.